Greetings and welcome to this Urban Institute webinar, Envisioning an Equitable Health System, Reweaving America's Social Contract. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Brian Smedley. I'm an equity scholar and senior fellow in the Health Policy Center and Office of Race and Equity Research at the Urban Institute. Before we get, begin our program, let me just go through a few quick housekeeping items. First, this event is being recorded and the recording will be posted online after the event. Closed captioning is enabled, and you can adjust the settings with the captions button at the bottom of your screen. Our speaker biographies are available in the chat box and also on our website at urban.org. All participants are muted, but you can type your questions and comments into the Q&A box at any time. We ask that you please take one to two minutes to complete the survey at the end of this event. Lastly, please engage with us online using the hashtag live at urban. Gives me great pleasure to welcome our two guests this afternoon, Drs. Tony Iton and Damon Francis. Dr. Iton is lecturer of health policy and management at the University of California, Berkeley School of Public Health and senior vice president for healthy communities at the California Endowment. Dr. Francis is medical director of the Homeless Health Center for the Alameda Health System and assistant clinical professor at the University of California, San Francisco. And again, I'm Brian Smedley, an equity scholar and senior fellow in the Office of Race and Equity Research and the Health Policy Center at the Urban Institute. We at the Urban Institute asked Drs. Iton and Francis to prepare and present a paper on the topic of envisioning an equitable health system at our March 23rd, 2023 symposium, marking the 20th anniversary of the IOM publication, Unequal Treatment, Confronting Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Healthcare. This symposium attracted dozens of health equity researchers and policymakers in person, and several hundred more uh, attended online. You can find a link to view the full symposium in the chat box. We commissioned nine papers in total for this symposium, which will be published over the course of the late summer, fall, and early winter this year. Among the topics addressed by scholars commissioned to prepare these papers are the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning in clinical decision supports, next steps to promote comprehensive demographic data collection and monitoring, strategies to promote effective health system and community partnerships, and payment strategies to incentivize equity, among other topics. These issues are critically important and payments and, uh, and those working to advance health equity will recognize this. But these topics largely reflect needed incremental reforms to existing systems. We asked Drs. Iton and Francis to offer something that we rarely see in the health equity literature, an aspirational vision of what a health system focused on health and equity as outcomes would look like. In this process, Dr. Zaitan and Francis discuss the principles uh, uh, that should uh, undergird such a system and the kinds of governance necessary to be accountable to the communities that health systems serve. Drs. Francis and Aitan, many thanks for crafting this outstanding paper, uh, which par participants at our March symposium were, for were fortunate to receive a preview. Uh, and your paper will be published in the next few weeks, and we'll, of course, disseminate it widely, including to participants uh, viewing this webinar. So again, uh, the full biographies for Dr. Dr. Zaitan and Francis can be found in our chat box. Let me begin by directing a question to both of you. The health equity literature is replete with studies documenting sources of inequity in existing systems. And again, this is critically important to understand when and where to intervene. But why is, this import why is it important to extend this further to envision a health system centered around health and equity and what keeps us from envisioning more, imagining something different rather than simply critiquing our current state? I pose this to both of you. Thank you, Brian. And it's always a pleasure to be with you and to, you know, to bask in, in your scholarship, uh, which has been quite extensive and inspiring. And it's always a pleasure to be with Damon. Um, you know, when we took on this paper, um, both Damon and I had uh, a, a little bit of hesitation about, you know, how broad we should essentially structure our analysis, because quite frankly, you can approach this issue from many different perspectives. But at the end of the day, I think what stood out for us is that the United States is exceptional across developed countries in the world. 
And we have failed on multiple occasions to construct a health system that is organized around health, never mind health equity. And the question becomes why? Why is this? Why, why are we struggling to craft the kind of health system that virtually any thoughtful person would design if they were given a blank sheet of paper uh, and, and a pencil? And of course, we recognize that the United States has pretty woeful health outcomes across the board, uh, life expectancy, infant mortality, ma maternal mortality, rates of chronic disease, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We spend more than everybody else. There have been analyses that show that um, when you add our spending on medical care to our spending on social services and benefits, that we actually don't spend more than anybody else. We just disproportionately spend in the least efficient part of that spectrum, which is downstream in the healthcare delivery system. So the question for us became, why? Why are we so different? And that led us to an analysis of both what actually produces health, but then further than that, what do countries that have a commitment to invest in the health and well-being of their uh, populations do differently than the United States and why? And so that took us to the analysis that we went through around social contract. Um, and I think that it provided for us kind of some eye-opening um, findings. Dr. Francis? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me as well. Um, and uh, I think in, in addition to, you know, what Tony shared, I think there's a, there's a, a way in which our system um, for those of us who care most about health equity, for those of us who are ready to put the most into it, our system focuses us on this defensive behavior. And I think that's a really big limitation to, to doing or even attempting what, you know, Tony and I tried to attempt in this paper. So, you know, I work in um, healthcare for people experiencing homelessness. And at any given moment, you know, even though I'm, I'm in clinic, you know, I have a panel of maybe 200 patients, I have several of them in the hospital. I have multiple programmatic initiatives I'm working on. Um, I have multiple local housing, you know, advocacy agenda things I'm working on. And yet the thing that actually perpetuates homelessness, the thing that actually perpetuates the horrible outcomes, the thing that perpetuates the racial inequities in homelessness is really this absence of a social contract and this absence of a system. But, you know, even someone who has time to think about these things, who is trying to organize around these things, you know, my day to day attention and focus ends up being on those battles that are urgent you know, in these fragmented pieces of our system. And so I think we have to come up with a way to overcome that so that those of us who care most about this issue can pool our energies together to get to something that solves, you know, in my area, homelessness and other areas, food insecurity, the criminal justice system. We have to understand that all of these realities, you know, are not just because of the social determinants of health, but they're really because of our absence to come together and say, what do we agree to do with and for each other as a society? in a way that pretty much as Tony said, you know, every other wealthy country has done much more functionally than, than we have. That's right, thank you for that. So in a way we're so consumed with the challenges that we're facing with our current system that it makes it difficult to begin to think about what might be needed in its place. Um, so we'll delve into that further. You, you describe in your paper, the need for a strong social contract, which is rarely part of our public discourse. What is it? What is a strong social contract? And where are there some, are there examples around the globe of countries that have a strong social contract? And why is it so hard to build such a contract in the United States? I pose it to both of you. Well, as as you know, uh, I, I I was born in the United States, but I grew up in Canada um, for my first seventeen years, and Canada has a strong system of universal health care, uh, universal child care, um, you know, comprehensive dental care, highly subsidized post-secondary education, deep investments in social resources like community centers, parks, uh, recreational space. And when I came to the United States, you know, to go to medical school, I was immediately struck by the absence of those kinds of investments in Baltimore, Maryland, where I went to medical school. And it struck me that 
despite the two countries sharing one of the largest borders in the world, they couldn't be more different when it came to how the country invested in its people. And, you know, some people mistakenly think that a uh, social contract has nothing to do with the United States. And, and those people are unfortunately not very aware of American history. American history was the Declaration of Independence itself is a social contract and expressly so. And the social contract is basically, a, it's, it's an exchange. Uh, in exchange for giving consent to be governed, the people of the country expect from that government um, investments that essentially enhance their well-being. And the moment that the government stops doing that, which is what the Declaration of Independence was, it was basically saying to King George, you no longer have our well-being at heart, and therefore we are rejecting your governance and reorganizing ourselves into the United States. And so this idea that there is consent of, of the governed uh, to the government in exchange for something beneficial, that's a social contract. And the question then becomes, how strong is that social contract? How, how much is it attending to those things that we know that human beings need in order to be able to navigate healthy and successful lives? And so virtually every other country in the world has, has made deep investments, has universal healthcare, for instance has childcare schemes that uh, allow working families to essentially be able to afford to have their children in a, in a high quality um, setting, has schemes around unemployment and, and a whole host of other things that essentially anticipate people's needs and provide resources should those needs materialize as they navigate their way through life. In the United States, our social contract is quite thin. We don't have universal health care. We don't have universal child care. We don't have, we don't really have a lot of universal anythings. And that is the question, why? Why do we lack universal policies? And in this paper, we explore the history of the United States uh, coming out of World War II and, and the Depression, and the, as opposed to the history of Western Europe, who had a very different reaction to World War II. And we ask ourselves, what does it take? to have a strong social contract. And ultimately, what it takes is a strong sense of shared solidarity across groups, a sense that you know there is this universal we, that our fates are inextricably intertwined and that we have to invest in each other's well-being. And that's what we lack in the United States. And you know, I, the, the conclusion that one is forced to come to when you try to understand why the US is so exceptional is looking at our history of, of chattel slavery, racism, and this, this barrier, this divisive barrier that has been created that makes it difficult for us to see each other as you know, essentially this universal we. So what we're seeing in the divided politics of America today has profound health consequences. For sure. Damon, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think, you know, we've we've seen, I think, some newer ways of these manifestations of, you know, racism in, um, in, in recent times that I think are um, kind of funneled through our individualist orientation and our sort of technocratic and industrial orientation around, you know, healthcare is what I know best, but, you know, I, I listen to educator colleagues talking about the same thing, right? How um, work that is about human to human interaction is about collective and individual well being has really become about, you know, individual units of service, um, about sort of transactional um, exchanges. And then that's led us really to organize our ability to make policy around the social contract in ways where it's like industrial sectors that are lining up together, you know. So when we had our big debate as, an, as, a, as a country about what we were going to do about healthcare. You know, it was really clear the insurance companies weren't going to be hurt. The hospitals were going to have their part. The doctors were going to have their part. The pharmaceutical companies were going to have their part. This is the way we were knitting together the conversation. And all of us were sort of, you know, organized around influencing these various actors. But people, you know, the patients of the system were really not organized in a collective way to be able to engage in that conversation. And I think this, this really serves. Um, 
you know, both explicitly sometimes. I mean, I think I think if you look at what's happened with the opioid pandemic, you have to see, you know, in these in these lawsuits that have been settled that there's really been explicit use of, you know, human beings as a way to 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 make profit. But I think even as powerful or more powerful than that is just implicitly our attention shifts from the well-being of everyone, from equity in that well-being to the delivery of these units of service and all of us sort of advocating for these individual pieces. And I think that's a story across the social contract, not just in our failure to sort of implement a universal health care system. That's absolutely right. So uh, the, the, our failure to see that our fates are intertwined, plus our failure to balance the interests of those who are profiting off of illness and sickness, uh, seems to be uh, an, an evergreen challenge in this country. I'm reminded of the period in during COVID. Uh, at one point uh, during the global pandemic, the U.S. with about 5% of the world's population had about 30% of the world's mortality. Pretty striking when so many people in the United States think that the United States has the world's best healthcare system. It's, of course, not the best. It's certainly the most expensive. But couldn't you comment on that? I mean, this, this, this shows up again and again, our, our failure to see that our fates are intertwined, coupled with deep social division and deep social hierarchies based on many factors, race, ethnicity, ability status, sexual orientation, and gender identity, so many factors. We in the U.S. seem to be so fractured and frayed. Is there any hope that we can come together if for no other reason than to understand that when it comes to our health, our fates are intertwined. Well, I'll just say quickly, and I want to defer to Damon on this one, but I'll just say quickly that there are some structural problems in the United States that are unfortunately barriers to us being able to, to invest um, in some of these universal programs. One is our the very structure of our government. We have a federal system as opposed to a national system. And you know, we explicitly um, give the states the power to essentially attend to the health of their state residents. Uh, so in order for the, the federal government to operate in this space, it has to do it with the consent of each of the individual states, which is a structural barrier that many other Western developed countries don't have to contend with. They have national governments, they have national health data systems, they can do analyses across the entire country quite easily. Um, we have these structural legal barriers to doing these things. And that's just something we have to recognize. That's the structure of our country. But the second thing is that we have a long history of distrust of government and particularly large government. And in order to do this, uh, in order to structure a health system that is focused on delivering health, you have to restructure the incentives within that system. And um, restructuring those incentives means that there has to be kind of a referee. There has to be a strong hand played by some neutral entity. And in virtually every other country, that referee is government. But in this country, we have a strong tradition of being suspicious of government, particularly you know, on the, on the more conservative side. That itself is tied to our racist history, um, which has fed into this movement for states' rights and and limiting the reach of the federal government so that states could essentially be free to do a lot of things themselves, including discriminate against Black and uh, Latino and, and Native American people. Um, so these histories are tied together, but these are structural and thematic barriers to organizing a health system that is rational, uh, built around health outcomes and processes that are built around health equity. Yeah, I mean, without an effective social contract, you know, our our chances for doing much better against the COVID pandemic, you know, structures or not, are minimal, right? If we have people in housing situations that are overcrowded or not in housing, if we have people that can't take time off of work when they're sick, you know, if if we have the enormous disparities that we have in in the economic situations and social situations that people are living in, um, regardless of the quality of traditional public health structures, regardless of the quality of you know, public health systems, regardless of the quality of health care systems, that is just such a, a, a big um, barrier to overcome. So you know, I think even in this question for me, the social contract is still central. And I think one of the, one of the central causal factors in, in, in you know, that, that reality of how the COVID pandemic hit 
how awful it was for all of us and how extremely awful it was, you know, for the most marginalized among us. Um, but I would, I would absolutely agree with Tony that there's a ton that we can do in the structure of the healthcare system. Um, you know, in addition to that, you know, federal sort of or organizing our federalist system in a, in a way that makes a little bit more sense. I think even at the local level, um, our healthcare system is very oriented towards hospitals. Hospitals are really the foundational way that we sort of think about as Americans, you know, what's, what, where is healthcare? You know, you point at the hospital and that's after someone's already gotten sick. Um, it's really not the place where we are able to, um, to deploy the most efficient resources to improve health, right? Testing, keeping people who, apart from each other who are, who are ill <laughs> and vaccinations. That's really the core of, you know, handling COVID. If you're waiting till someone gets to the ICU to think about preventing COVID deaths, it's way too late to, to make, to, to have a big impact. And so we really do need to think structurally about our investments in primary care infrastructure. Other countries that had universal primary care that were organized with place-based primary care, distributed testing and vaccines at just remarkably faster rates than we were able to accomplish in the United States. We did have some, some really great innovation, I think, in the area of community partners coming together, partnering with healthcare organizations to do things, to build new systems and structures. You know, we had a great coalition of folks here in Oakland that, you know, put on community testing events in, in, in really accessible sites and community vaccination events and things like that. And we saw that around the country. But I think, you know, what we really needed a foundational level for, for level for COVID and, you know, everything else is a system that's structured that way from the beginning. Um, and that leverages those same principles in our, in our baseline design. That's right. And even as we're talking about the challenges that we face here in the US, some that are deeper challenges than in other parts of the world, given our history, you point to in your paper some inspiring examples. And we're going to get to the specific examples or some specific examples of communities that are attempting to re-envision, recreate health systems. But before we do that, can you speak to some of the issues that leave you, I think, hopeful, right? There's some things like demographic change. We know that um, we are becoming a, a more diverse country. We know that our younger generation of voters is more progressive uh, than prior generations. And we know that there are instances, examples of communities, locations, states, such as California, that responded to a, uh, I'll call it a rightward tilt with Proposition 187, but then that seemed to have spurred a new movement uh, toward equity. Can you speak to some of those forces that give you hope despite our division yeah and and you you touched on the ones that we touch on in the paper um and you know one of the great pleasures of writing this paper was to work with damon and to really kind of tussle around this issue about where's the hope you know what do we look to to point us in the right direction and so we spent some time thinking about those things and as you point to one of the facts that we have to contend with that it's real and and you know I, I like to tell people you know when I uh, leave California and I'm giving a speech somewhere else I say hi my name's Tony I'm from California which means I'm from the future what happens to us today in California will happen to you tomorrow and so you should watch California to understand the arc of change and um, California went through a pretty significant demographic shift um, over the past 25, 30 years, both in terms of the racial ethnic makeup of the state, as well as the aging of the state as well, which has uh, profound implications for how we structure our health system and how much we invest in prevention and keeping people at home and safe so that they can age in place. Um, but the thing that California also um, tells, the story it tells is about Proposition 187, which uh, for those of you who aren't from California, I'll just quickly summarize it. It was 1994. It was a ballot proposition. It was a time that our governor was uh, a Republican by the name of Pete Wilson, who actually was quite unpopular and was running for a second term. And most of the forecasters were projecting that he would lose. Prop 187 was basically very much akin to policy that Donald Trump subsequently adopted many decades later. Prop 187 would deny 
all services, all government services to undocumented Californians. Uh, that includes health care. That includes schools for children, for kindergartners. They would be denied. It was put on the ballot in 1994, and it won. 60 percent of Californians voted in favor of Prop 187. And it was shocking. Um, of course, I and many other people were involved in fighting it. We took it to court and we got it invalidated. However, what it did more importantly is it galvanized a whole generation of leaders to get involved in the formal political process, to run for office, and to make sure that never again would California do something as blatantly racist um, as denying kindergarten to five-year-old children um, based on their ethnicity and their place of origin. And so California pivoted from 1994 to you know, early 2000s, and we see just dramatic policy shift. And the lesson of this is that there are really two narratives in this country that are constantly doing battle. One narrative is a narrative of exclusion, which is, you know, for lack of a better way of describing it, it's a Donald Trump narrative. It's that America is about a people, disproportionately white people. Those people are more deserving. Uh, other people are a threat. Um, they're slightly subhuman. So dehumanizing them is part of the narrative. And that um, we are living in a zero, zero sum game and there aren't enough resources for everybody. And by the way, the past was great and the future is scary. That's one narrative that um, drove Pete Wilson in 1994 in California and Trump and others uh, on the national stage in the present day. But there's a competing narrative, which is now the dominant uh, California narrative, which is about inclusion and belonging. And that narrative does things slightly differently. First of all, it changes the narrator. It lets people tell their own story and share their humanity with us. So we see our experiences in their experiences. It argues that our fates are inextricably intertwined and we have to invest in each other. And it looks to the past with realistic and honest eyes. It talks about slavery, it talks about genocide, it talks about the incarceration of the Japanese, the exclusion of the Chinese, the mistreatment of women, uh, the denial of rights to LGBTQ. And it looks to the future with hope and says that we can actually build the multiracial democracy that this world has been begging for. And those two narratives are in competition. And California pivoted roughly from 1994 to the present from an exclusionary narrative to an inclusionary narrative. And that inclusionary narrative of belonging has yielded policy. We're rebuilding our social contract. We're investing in all of our people. We have near universal health care, including undocumented people. We let undocumented people take the California bar and practice law, take the licensing exam, practice medicine. And get driver's licenses and get in-state tuition. Um, we are trying to deconstruct our mass incarceration uh, efforts. Uh, we're investing heavily in, uh, in LGBTQ and trans protections. We still have problems. We still have big problems around housing, cost of living, income inequality, um, but we have a story of California, which is about us. It's about shared solidarity. And as I said, California is America's future. We believe that with hard work, this won't happen naturally, but with hard work, this will be America's future. And those kinds of investments in changes and policies will lead us to be able to create a health system that is about equity, that is about health outcomes, and that repair some of the past harms of racial inequity um, and injury to populations that have been dehumanized. That's so beautifully said, Tony, and it's such an inspiring example and so important for folk working in this space today, because we are in a very difficult period politically where we see the consequences of division uh, and the fact that policies based on division are harmful to our health broadly. Uh, and so I, this, is, this to me is one of the reasons why everybody should read this paper, because this example alone gives a lot of hope. Um, let me begin to pivot, but before I do, I want to remind our listeners that if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box because we want to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can, and we're about to turn to audience questions in about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Tony and Damon and I will continue to talk. I'm interested in 
uh, more of these wonderful examples. In your paper, you provide examples of communities that have built and are continuing to build systems that promote health, equity, and well-being. Are there some that stand out? And is there hope that these approaches can be sustained and even expanded in the face of market forces that dominate the healthcare arena? I pose it to, to both of you or either. Yeah, I think I can I can start and I'll just say I, I walked out of high school in 1994. That's uh, that's where I was when uh, Prop 187, um, you know, was on the ballot. And uh, and that story is, you know, really, really personal. We also had an area, an era of California history before, um, you know, before the Pete Wilson era that was more inclusive, that built the UCs. Right. That 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 built a lot of. Um, the sort of platform, the universalist platform for for economic success, for social success in California, and so I think for me that story just illustrates what a long game it is to work on health equity, um, especially in you know at a moment in time where I think a lot of us are just sort of beset by like the current election cycle and those kinds of things. You know, I think it's important for us to really zoom out and understand and learn from that that sort of full scope of history. Um, and you know, related to that, I think some of the best examples we found of people building systems for human well-being, for health, um, really come from indigenous communities, um, in, both in the United States and, and abroad. So one of the better examples that many folks in the healthcare space are familiar with is South Central Foundation, which is a healthcare organization that, um, is, that serves Alaskan Natives and is owned by Alaskan Natives in, um, in the southern central area of, uh, of Alaska. And that organization is based on the fact that sovereign people decided to take over ownership from the federal government of their own healthcare services because they were unhappy with how those services were being delivered and reframed the entire definition of patients and turned that into customer owners. So the idea at the governance level was when someone walks into the clinic, that is an owner of this institution, right? And that is a person who is deciding and also frankly has responsibility. You know, there's mutuality in it. They're the ones who are setting my salary if I'm a healthcare provider in that system, right? So it really creates a much more explicit acknowledgement of the social contract inside of how healthcare services are delivered. And the corollary to that is it drives relationship-centered care, which is really a key piece of the success that South Central Foundation has had. So if you have a chronic illness, I don't treat you as a bag of issues that I can deal with with separate lines of service every time you show up. I treat you as a person I have a relationship with who has relationships with other people in this community, who has relationships with this land that we live on, and we are working together to collectively steward your well-being, my own, the well-being of the people around us and the land we're on. That's a profoundly different way of thinking about what the healthcare enterprise is. And on the strength of those transformations and others, um, the South Central Foundation has achieved really, really dramatic results in, in healthcare, for which they're you know, um, rightfully really well known. They've won the Malcolm Baldridge uh, Award for Quality um, twice, for example, in the last 20 years. Um, which is, you know, a really, really high standard around um, around quality performance. I, I will say, as a limitation, we still see horrible and dramatic disparities in health outcomes for Alaskan natives, in spite of the existence of probably one of our best examples of healthcare quality transformation in the country, one of the best ways and places to provide health care without the, the what we the transformation we need in this in the social contract, we're still going to be limited in terms of the outcomes that, that, that we can achieve. But I think those principles that underlie the development of that system really have a lot to teach us you know, across, across the country about how we want to design these systems. Exactly. And being accountable to the communities that, that these health systems are serving seems to be so central to, uh, to this work. And being, uh, in, in having community members as the governance uh, to help ensure that uh, these services are tailored to, to communities' needs. I want to remind listeners, if you have questions for this wonderful conversation, please type them into the Q&A box. We're going to try to get to as many audience questions as we can after we uh, tee up a few more uh, questions for Damon and, and Tony. Um, you know, we, we started this work, uh, Tony and Damon, talking about what happened 20 years ago with the publication of the Unequal Treatment Report. 
And so it's important to look back, but it's also important to look forward. As part of our work, we were very concerned about lifting up a new generation of scholars and activists that will take on the mantle of this work. So from a generational standpoint, those of us who've been actively committed to health equity and working in the field, we're standing on the shoulders of giants and also mired within a hole that has been dug by a long history preceding us. The road ahead is long, winding, and often rough. What do you say to those uh, early in their careers who are coming after us to continue this work, who 20 years from now will be closer to the point in, in their careers uh, where, where we are? What can we say to those folk uh, engaged in this work um, to ensure that they keep their eyes on the prize, so to speak? Yeah, what a wonderful question, Brian. Um, let me just point to the fact that um, there, there, 20 years ago, there were so many fewer people that were trying to point to the underlying root causes of health inequity. Um, we didn't really have inequity as really kind of a term. We talked about disparities, um, which you know some researchers just saw as differences. Others saw as suspicious differences that deserve some you know investigation. And um, you know we we had a barely any concept of you know some of the structural racism and the examples that we see so so vividly today in so many of our systems across the board. Still, obviously, there are people who deny that it exists and 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 refuse to acknowledge that there are things outside of individual level uh, bias. So I do think that there are a, a, there's a much larger group of people now trying to find the truth. And I think at the end of the day, that's what I would say to younger researchers is to be relentless truth seekers. We know that um, the stories that we told ourselves about healthcare is about genes, it's about behaviors, it's about access to healthcare, at least health status. Those three things don't hold water when you by themselves, when you look at the actual patterns of disease in this country that have manifest themselves over the past 20 plus years and have gotten worse, including for white people. And you know, so the point of, of this is that if you pursue the truth, you will get to the truth, but you have to be relentless in pursuing the truth. The recognition that um, there's a lot of collateral damage to racism. I, I spent some time in South Africa when I was in medical school and um, people in Soweto used to tell me that racism and apartheid were doomed because it takes a lot of energy to put your foot on somebody's neck. You, you are holding them down, but you are holding yourself down too. And that's what we see in the collateral damage of, of racism, the absence of a strong social contract has profound implications for white people. In, in so far as now, white Americans, wealthy white Americans have health status and chronic disease levels that are about equal to the poorest Europeans. And you know, most people don't know that. Most people, when you show them the data, they have a hard time understanding it. How could this be? And that is because of this collateral damage. The absence of a strong social contract hurts us all, including our, our wealthiest. And so at the end of the day, you have to pursue the truth. Don't accept, I went through medical school and they would tell me that the disparities were behavioral. You know, it was the smoking, the drinking, the driving without a seatbelt, the sex without condoms. That's what we were supposed to do. We were supposed to like, essentially hector people in the 15 minutes we had in a cubicle to get them to stop whatever behavior they were engaged in. We never thought about what's driving these behaviors, what kind of choices are structured in this person's life, what kind of stressors exist in the day-to-day -day life of these patients that we have actually created through the absence of affirmative policy. So that's my advice to younger researchers is don't believe me. Don't believe Damon or Brian. Pursue the truth. Try to understand what's driving these phenomena and be relentless. 
I love that, Tony. Damon, anything to add to that? Yeah, it was beautiful. Uh, I think, um, you know, we have often neglected the cultural foundations of our own survival. Um, and I think, you know, uh, my generation and older, you know, I've traded off, I think, investing in my own cultural development for my own professional development. And I, I really would recommend to, you know, the, the generation coming up that you remember that sort of what got us here, you know, what got my great, great grandparents who were enslaved Africans through was not a professional education. It was lots and lots of things about their culture that, you know, may seem less relevant for me, but I think spending the time to understand um, how people survived based upon the ways they interacted with each other, the music, the food, the way they tended land, the way they came together um, is really of value. And I'm coming back later in life to that deeper understanding. And there's some examples in the paper where we really, you know, even those of us who are in, whether it's healthcare services or other individually oriented service areas, I think can figure out ways to uh, reinvigorate the cultures that we come from to help, to help create better outcomes for the future, to help preserve that asset for, you know, for future generations. And then, I, you know, I, I, I agree with Tony, don't believe us. Um, and I, I try to say to younger folks who, you know, want to talk to me about their careers, don't, don't take my advice. But I think do, do know your history, do find your place in it, do understand what people thought before, why they thought that. That's part of seeking the truth. So it's not to say don't spend time with us, don't, you know, don't, uh, you know, or just ignore us, but don't necessarily believe us, right? Make that part of the, make that part of the, the data that you're evaluating and understanding. I so appreciate uh, what you've both said. Relentless pursuit of the truth, know your history. What we think is true today may be debunked in 20 years. So, uh, so that is really important. And I think, I, I hope that all of our, uh, future leaders in this space are are taking that to heed. We've got some really outstanding questions coming in from our audience, so I would love to dive right in. And I uh, apologize in advance because we we will not be able to get to all of these questions, but I'm going to try to uh, raise as many of them as I can and ask uh, Tony and Damon that you uh, each just dive in as you see fit. The first question is regarding federalism and a lack of a stronger social contract. Can you speak to the politicization of health, particularly in light of recent Supreme Court decisions regarding abortion, gender affirming care, affirmative action in higher education, and likely and its likely impact on medical school admissions, et cetera? Thoughts about uh, our current politicization of health? Yes, I mean, and this is obviously kind of right at the heart of the problem in, in this country, and it has profound health consequences. And, and so this inability to essentially create shared solidarity leads to Supreme Court decisions like the one around affirmative action. It's this suspicion that there's a zero sum and that somebody's getting over on somebody else and taking away from somebody else. This idea that there's a limited number of, of college admission spots and therefore, you know, somebody who, who got in because of a history of discrimination in their family and in, in their community is somehow taking something away from somebody else. That whole zero-sum mindset is the problem. And so I think that the, uh, the politicization, you know, that concept of politicizing things like health is fundamentally comes back to narrative. It comes back to the story of we, who we are and how we move through this world together and how we construct a society that benefits all of us. So I think that the at, at the end of the day, our task is to rebuild that sense of we. Who is an American in the 21st century? What do we stand for? What do we invest in? What do we value? Because that narrative will shape the policies and those policies will create the conditions that we'll have to deal with in the emergency rooms. So if we want to get to a place where our health is actually on par with the rest of the developed world, and, and including some parts of the less developed world we're, we're slipping behind, if we want to get to that place, 
we have to strengthen the bonds between us. And at the end of the day, that means telling a different story of we. Now that sounds like, you know, hoo-ha, crazy, pie in the sky stuff, but look at history. We've done it before. It's not as if this has never happened. We come together, unfortunately, recently, not for very long, but we've come together in the past and built a story of we. And in the process of so doing, we've made incredible investments um, in our country, in our infrastructure, and in our people. And we, we, we can do that. We've done it before, we can do it again. At the end of the day, honestly, we're at a fork in the road and we have a choice about whether we pursue these divisive politics of destruction or whether we reforge our narrative and reweave our social contract. That's the, that's the decision we're facing today, every single day in our political debates. Thanks for that, Tony. I've got a question that relates directly to what you just said, because in our past, we have come together uh, imperfectly. Uh, we have examples of how the country has moved forward toward a social contract, again, however, imperfectly. The question is, are there lessons we can learn from the Social Security legislation of the 1930s? Again, imperfect because of, it, of its purposeful exclusion of workers of color or Medicare's enactment in 1965. What can we learn about how that legislation was advanced into law in those at that period? And we talk about this in the paper um, very, very explicitly. You know, when FDR went about crafting the New Deal, the U.S. was coming out of a, a dramatic economic crisis. As a matter of fact, it was going into a dramatic economic crisis. And the New Deal was a new social contract. I mean, that was explicitly what was intended. And it was about essentially strengthening the role of government in the lives of Americans. So the government would guarantee certain types of supports and resources and investments to prevent the crisis uh, that was the depression. And at the time, uh, Roosevelt and some others thought about universal health care. Uh, we talk about this in the paper and decided to back off because that was considered to be kind of like this creeping socialism at the time, um, very unique to the United States. Whereas in other countries, um, they took a very different path. We talk about uh, what happened in the 60s and essentially the civil rights movement. And in some ways, Medicare and Medicaid were products of the civil rights movement. Um, they were a recognition that there was a, a need to essentially invest in the very obvious vulnerability of certain populations. Now, that movement started for universal health care, and it ended up in Medicaid and Medicare, um, in part, again, because of the same politics of Social Security. Um, we talk about this in the paper where uh, Southern Democrats had votes needed to be bought. And um, so compromises were made to essentially make it harder for African Americans in the case of Social Security. Some 60% of African Americans weren't eligible for Social Security. And in the South, it was even higher because they were either working in domestic service or they're working in agriculture. And those two uh, fields were essentially precluded from being able to participate in the Social Security system. Uh, Medicare was a great force to essentially desegregating hospitals in the South, which was um, a, a source of great resistance uh, for many Southern political leaders. So racism has been this Achilles heel, which has injured our efforts um, in this country over the years to take these movements and take them to their logical conclusion. We always stop just short. And when you analyze it, you have to ask, why is that? I'll just say quickly, Europe came through World War II, devastated, bombed, um, feeling profound shared vulnerability, um, and decided to invest heavily in their social contract. And, and that's where many of the universal schemes in healthcare, unemployment, and whatnot emerged post-World War II in Europe because of that, that shared moment of vulnerability that they had been through. The United States, other than Pearl Harbor, didn't really experience you know, the devastating consequences of World War II. We came out with a very different message. Our message was that we were basically the world's saviors and that we were largely invincible. So we actually doubled down on many of the policies that uh, had you know, ultimately led to the exclusion of African-Americans. We built out the interstate highway system. We built out the suburbs. 
Um, we invested in the GI Bill, excluded African Americans disproportionately and others, um, and, and created an affirmative action system for whites uh, in this country. And, and, you know, there were inklings of sort of this sense of shared solidarity, but it papered over all of the continuing racism um, that led to African Americans and others being excluded from the benefits of many of these policies. So we have to get that right because it's still our Achilles heel. Yeah, I, I would just quickly add uh, that I think the European um, comparisons are really important for, for us to understand that health and healthcare is politicized everywhere. It's always going to be political. It's very important. <laughs> so Europeans are also fighting over these issues. They're coming up with remarkably different solutions from each other. You know, some are government delivered healthcare. Some is regulated, but essentially completely privately delivered. There's an organization of primary care providers that has organized their own night coverage in some countries to keep people out of the ER. I mean, there are many, many creative solutions that emerge out of many different political processes. But the fundamental point is that the social contract underlies all those variety of solutions. So it's not to say that health is not going to be political here, but I think we need to broaden the range of who we're learning from and, and, and take our policy debates to much more useful ground. Like, what are the possibilities here? We, you know, we act like there's nothing left to fight over. Like we're worried we're going to stop fighting. Politics is going to be here. We got plenty to fight about. But can we fight over some smarter, you know, uh, possibilities at least? Absolutely, La Lucha Continua. We have a question uh, that is uh, related. Our, our questioner asks about uh, resource allocation uh, and um, how can we begin to prioritize uh, the goals that, that uh, we may have. Uh, and so the questioner asks, um, uh, how, how would you rate the importance of instituting universal health care versus a shift in where we spend our money, such as spending more money on social services? Or is it even possible to look at these things separately? So I guess the question is, uh, is it an either or, universal health care or investing more upstream or both? I mean, I think, um, I think the distinction I would draw rather than health care versus upstream is individual orientation and service orientation versus the social contract. And I think it's quite clear that even where we have excellent individual services and in health or education or other areas, that if we don't have a social contract, if we don't say every one of us is entitled to these things, this is what we believe you get by virtue of being a member of our society, we're, we're not going to get healthier people. We're not going to get equitably healthier people. Now, the role I think of those of us in these individually oriented service settings, you know, for me, it's healthcare, but I think it, it could be for people working in other service settings, is to work in a way that emphasizes strengthening our power to deliver a social contract. So you better believe that the fight in California to achieve universal healthcare has helped us strengthen the social contract more broadly. It's brought people into the analysis, it's brought people into relationship with each other. So I that's the way I tend to I tend to think of these things is, is very much together. And I think that the more we engage these sort of, you know, upstream, downstream is the healthcare one, public health versus healthcare, and don't reframe the question for ourselves, the more we sap our own power and energy. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely right. And, and the way I've said it in the past is that the most important part of that phrase, universal healthcare, is the universal part. It's the universal part which speaks to shared solidarity. And it is the first brick in rebuilding our social contract because it's a, it's obvious. Um, it's it's a statement that we all belong. That you know, it's not about the healthcare. It's about the sense that you are me, I am you. We belong together. Our fates are inextricably intertwined. That's what universal means. So I love universal healthcare, and I'm a doctor but I love it for the universal part. I like it for the healthcare part. I like that a lot. Let me try to squeeze in one other quick question before we pose a concluding question to both of you as we wrap up uh, with about five minutes left. 
Uh, this question asks, uh, when we think about the role of philanthropic organizations in supporting community-based efforts to re-envision and build new health systems uh, from the group up, how can or should we adjust our expectations for timeline for evidence of effectiveness? Two years or even five-year time, time horizons for showing results seems unrealistic, and yet organizations must be accountable to their funders. Thoughts about um, the role of uh, philanthropic organizations and timelines in this work? Well, um, you know, as a active philanthropist, if you will, um, you know, we take this very seriously. When we decided that we would invest in trying to improve the health status of about a million low-income Californians who had been experiencing uh, profound health disparities that are well-documented, uh, measurable, and egregious. We decided that we wouldn't do it for two years or for five, that we would do it for 10, and that 10 was probably still not enough, that this is generational work. So we built our Building Healthy California a building healthy community, excuse me, initiative in California um, ended up being almost two billion dollars over a decade around this idea that this was generational work, and you can do that um, if you set your benchmarks, your metrics, to recognize that there is an enormous lag between intervention and health status change, but there are proxies all along the way good proxies that are actually well documented in the literature so um, you can actually check your progress as you move we believe at the california endowment that health is political and we define political small p um, politics is essentially the struggle over the allocation of limited and precious social goods and amongst those limited and precious social goods are things like having a park in your neighborhood or a sidewalk or potable water coming out of your tap or a grocery store. These are things that we can actually measure, the delivery of those things that change the environment. And at the end of the day, we know that changed environments, health protective environments are associated with healthier people. So we can track the proxies all along the way. And again, be relentless truth seekers. Try to see if these things actually do prove themselves out. And that's what we've done at the California Endowment. Yeah, I'd like to just add that I think this is philanthropy is really fertile ground for this tension that we talk about on the paper between technocracy and democracy. And I think you need to make sure that if you're in philanthropy, you're flipping that last question. So you need to keep the organizations accountable to the funders, but you also need to keep the funders accountable to the beneficiaries. And I think if we had as much attention to that as you know, the South Central Foundation example, I think is a great example of that as we needed, we'd get a lot more of the, of the technical questions right. Um, and you know, we, we privilege the technical questions too much in philanthropy and the democratic questions too little. <laughs> that is so well said, Damon. I love that line. Let me pose one final question to you both and just ask you just to take a few seconds to answer this and then we'll wrap up. Imagine it's, it's 2043, 20 years from now. What would you like the state of health equity to be and what milestones or markers will we see along the way? Maybe I'll go first so Tony can wrap up. I mean, I think, uh, I. It's so hard. This this exercise was so hard to envision this, but obviously, you know, a narrowing of the disparities, I think, would show that we're on the right track. So, you know, I want to see black and brown people healthier. Uh, I want to see uh, the black and brown youth of today, you know, leading the institutions and strategies of tomorrow in a way that I never thought I, you know, I never thought of. That's better. That's better than anything I could have conceived of. I think, you know, the milestones along the way, I think, our policy debates will make more sense, you know, around healthcare, we'll be able to acknowledge like we're getting a really bad deal for our dollars and we can look at Europe and design something regardless of our preferences regarding, regarding public or private systems, right? The child tax credit, which has support across the political spectrum, has obvious health benefits, would have like normal politics around it, you know, <laughs> when, when, you know, conservative people are like, we care about families, there's this thing that does so much for families. We would have normal politics around that instead of kind of the wild politics. I think there'll be some milestones around getting past this political moment to getting back to policy debates that are grounded in human well-being. 
And then, you know, I think in some of these areas, like, you know, where I work in homelessness, like we'll, we'll build tangible local results that will teach us how to have democracy at a, at a bigger level. You know, I think we're going to learn how to, how to really listen to the people who are closest to, um, to the problems and the solutions um, and really design, you know, policy and practice on the basis of, of their voices. And I, I think we're going to feel, we're going to feel that in our careers in this work that, People are in the room. We're listening in different ways. We're learning things. We're changing, and it does not feel the same as it felt to go to grad school. You know that there's a different there's a different feeling that we have, and that's going to be, I think, a milestone. Absolutely, Tony. Very simply, Brian, um, I want to live in a world, and I hope by 2043 I will live in that world, and I'm still alive, God willing, um, where your zip code is not a, more important than your genetic code when it comes to your health, and you know, that summary analysis tells you everything you need to know about inequity in the United States, the 25 to 30 year life expectancy difference across very small geographic areas is driven by present day racist, structural racist policy and the legacy of an enormous amount of, of historical racism that still manifests itself in, in people's day to day lives. There are places very close by in the world where your zip code does not, um, it's not more important than your genetic code. And um, we hope that California will be one of those places by 2043. And we hope that the United States will be just right behind us. I want to thank you both, Dr. Tony Aiton, Dr. Damon Francis, for a wonderful and engaging conversation and a simply outstanding paper that I will take as my holy grail for what we are seeking to achieve. I want to thank the entire Urban Institute Unequal Treatment at 20 team, our communications team uh, that helped to put this webinar together. Please stay tuned to urban.org as we have additional conversations with our paper authors and as we release papers such as the paper that Drs. Aiton and Francis have written on envisioning an equitable healthcare system. Thank you for listening. Please stay tuned and we look to see you at a future webinar. Thank you.